So we're starting a new message series, Jesus Unfiltered. And uh, as I was working and putting this uh, series together, I was thinking a lot about how we tend to read the New Testament and the Gospels. Coming off of Christmas, and then now we're going to look at the life of Christ. We know that the, the manger is there, but it's overshadowed by a, cro- by a cross because Christ was born to die. And as I put this series together, I chose a, a theme passage which comes out of 1 John and a version of the Bible called the Message, which is a paraphrased Bible. But it says this, The word of life appeared right before our eyes. We saw it happen. And now we're telling you in most sober praise that what we witnessed was incredibly this. The infinite life of God himself took shape before us. We saw it. We heard it, and we're now, we're telling you so you can experience it along with us. And this experience of communion with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. So He's saying, I've recorded this, we've witnessed it, and I'm sharing it with you so you too can have that communion with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Now watch, our motive for writing is simply this. We want you to, what does it say? Enjoy. (laughs) We want you to enjoy this too. Your joy will double our joy. Interesting, isn't it? So I want you to think about our joy. The disciples actually had a lot of joy working with Jesus. And when we think about this unfiltered Christ, I think so often we can read the scriptures without any emojis, right? And so we don't know, just like our texts that we text one another. Have you ever gotten somebody's text and you went, wow, that's offensive. And they're like, dude, I wasn't trying to be offensive. Or, or you're like, Haha, that's funny. And they're like, no, I was serious. I mean, we don't, sometimes we read the scriptures and we don't always see what's there. And we read it so sterile. And so this whole, this whole thought, I, I, I want you to think about a time when Jesus was talking with his disciples and they're, they were talking about taxes and needing to pay their taxes. And so Jesus says, Peter, I want you to go down, throw a line into the lake and catch a fish. And in that fish's mouth is going to be some money so we can pay our taxes. And Peter's like, okay. And he goes, and exactly that happens. Now, how playful is that? Think, just stop, stop a second and think about that. Jesus chose that method to pay his taxes. Now, some of you may have already got your tax things in the mail and you're already thinking, yeah, new year, new taxes. Now, I've seen a lot of pictures of Jesus, but have you seen many of him laughing? Seriously, okay? Have you seen many pictures of Jesus laughing? And so in this series, I want us to laugh a little bit with Jesus. I want us to to consider a little bit about experiencing his playfulness. His disruptive, extravagant personality. And some of you are already saying, where are you going with this? I don't think this is right. Remember after Jesus' resurrection, when he was standing on the shoreline and his disciples had returned back to their work and some of them were in a boat, they'd fished all night and not caught anything. And they're coming into shore in the morning and Jesus is standing there and what does he say? If you know the story, it's something that is said every time I go fishing and I come in and I've got my boat and I'm coming in. So there'll be somebody on the shore who says, you catch anything? (laughs) Jesus, resurrected from the dead, standing there looking at those disciples and said, did you catch anything? To which they said, no, we didn't catch anything. And I've said that before, too. Nope, (laughs) no luck today. And Jesus says, cast your nets on the other side of the boat and you will get a harvest. And they did. They threw their nets over and there was an abundance of fish. Now this had happened before. And so Jesus, think about it. I mean, wasn't he being a little playful and revealing himself? Hey, guys, catch anything? Because they didn't recognize him. And he said, well, try the other side. All right. And they catch all these fish. And it was Peter who recognized and said, it's the Lord. 
And he jumps in the water and he swims to shore. And he runs up to... Now, dripping wet. You've been in the river. You've been in the lake with your clothes on. All dripping wet. Now, I don't think Peter ran up to Jesus and went, How you doing, Lord? Great to see you. Come on. Don't you think Jesus was laughing and saying, John, Peter, come on. I'm here again. And I'm sure Peter just wrestled up on him, maybe even tackled him into the sand. So excited he was there. But we so often read our text so, what, without seeing some of that fun, playful stuff of Jesus. And so I'm kind of excited about this series because we're going to go to places where Jesus went. We're going to see people that Jesus touched and saw and ministered to. In fact, if you'd like to know more about what's coming up, we prepare a, our worship design team puts together a service and we do the whole, what is it, uh, the word that we're going to be using, the title of the passage. There's some on the Connect Center out there for you. And so we put those together for every series. So if you want to see where we're going a little bit more, just grab a hold of one of those. But today we're starting with Ordinary Places. And Jesus goes to his hometown. So open your Bibles or your phone app to Mark chapter 6. Common. Common people. Jesus goes to his hometown and it's a bunch of commoners. Common people. And uh, I want you to think about that in the New Testament, really, we don't see a whole lot of Jesus' teenage years recorded, except for that incident at the temple when he was 12, right? And his parents were wondering where he was and where did you think I would be, but with, you know, talking about my father's business. <clears throat> then later we see, I think it's uh, Luke just records that, and he grew in wisdom and stature before men and before God. We just don't see a whole lot. So a lot of Jesus' life was very common as he lived there in Nazareth. Now, he was born in Bethlehem as we celebrate, but he lived the early part of and most of his life there in the surroundings of Nazareth. And so we see this, this common people. So I want you to think about that. Oftentimes, New Year's resolutions, we come with, I'm going to do something big this year. I'm going to do something really different. Or I'm going to do something significant this year. Not like last year. It's a day of fresh starts. I can do something. I can change something. I can be, right? It's just a cycle that a lot of us get into. But yet, when we look at Jesus' life, 30 years of his life was common, normal. Everyday stuff. And so I want to encourage you not to minimize on this day of resolutions, not to minimize the, the simpler things, the common things. In fact, if we see Jesus here as not only a common people, but he lived a common life. They say, isn't this the carpenter? So Jesus is just, you know, a, a common life. He's, he had lived a common life there in, in Nazareth. I was looking at um, Max Lucado in one of his books, and he says this, Note what the neighbors did not say. The neighbors did not say, Isn't this the carpenter who owes me money? <laughs> right? Isn't this the carpenter who did a bad deal with my dad? Isn't this the carpenter who never finished that table I asked him to make? <laughs> they, they don't say those things. No, those words were never said, Max Licato said. He says this, The job may have been common, but his diligence was not. Jesus took his work seriously. So all those years, just the, the common repetition, the common work, Jesus took seriously. It's Luke 3, 23. It says, now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. Let me ask you, do you think Jesus was any less holy in those first 30 years than he was when he started his ministry, as Luke tells us? Was he any less holy? Was he any less God in the flesh? No, no. Do you, do you think God was like, wow, Jesus, you know, growing up, yeah, okay, but man, when he started his ministry, whoa, boy, then God was really proud of him, right? Then God was like, now you're doing something. 
I'm so proud of you. Well, if you look back, there's baptism. What did God say? This is my beloved son and who I am well pleased. At the start of his ministry, God was already pleased. It's not by what Jesus did that made God love him more. And the same is true for us. Jesus returns to Nazareth in our story here today. And he'd been there once before. In fact, they ran him out of town. They threatened to kill him. They threatened to throw him off a cliff. If that was you in your hometown, would you ever go back again? (laughs) If folks of Wendell decided to throw you off the canyon rim wall, you probably wouldn't return, right? So look at the grace that Jesus has already as he says, you know what? I'm going back there. I'm going back. I'm giving him another chance. Another chance as he spoke in the synagogue, as he spoke there, as was his custom as he went to worship. Give him another chance, another opportunity to hear his word. Another chance, another opportunity to believe. Another chance, another opportunity to be saved. And yet, the story tells us many of them, their hearts were hard. They didn't get rid of them. They just didn't take him seriously. How many people does that describe in our community today? It's not that they want to do away with God. They just don't take him seriously. Right? Jesus knew what was going to happen to him. In fact, Peter records it this way. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. He knew what was going to happen. Born in a manger, yet destined to a cross to die. But yet the power of the resurrection. Jesus came to reveal God to us. And he's the defining word of God. God he, as he talked with his disciples, they said, show us the Father. And there's no emoji there, but if you listen to Jesus' words, how can you say that to me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. There's a sense of sadness there, a sense of hurt in those words. And Jesus is like, you want to see what God's like? Look at me. And so I just want to challenge you of your view of God, if it's biblical or experiential of how you grew up. As we dig into these scriptures over these next weeks, I'm going to challenge you to see God the way Jesus, because Jesus said it. You want to see God the Father, look at me. I'm right here. And there's a playfulness of Jesus that he desires to have active in your life, just like he shows in his own life a sense of purpose and intentionality that Jesus did the same that he asks us to do and sometimes it means going to places that we think could be hostile to us you know as we go through our daily life that song we sung for the offering or listen to being sung about walk with me and I was thinking about just life in general and again maybe playing with my granddaughters I had my first g day with my granddaughter, Kiara, on Friday. And we went and had ice cream. <laughs> and it was fun. It, when you look at life through the life of an innocent little child, it, it changes your perspective on stuff. We can get so wrapped up in so many other things. Not that they're not important, but don't we forget to be amazed at snow on the ground or be amazed at how ice cream gets on your face. <laughs> You know, just the simple things in life. We can easily miss it. And, and this is a time of resolution, a time of you, where we look back on 2016 and maybe there's things we regret. But let's not wallow in them. And maybe as we look forward to 2017 and we have big goals and ideas, let's not just live there. Let's live in the moment. Let's let's live in the moment where you are right now, right here in this place, sitting in this moment. You know, Jim Elliott was a missionary who was slaughtered. He was killed. And he said this, wherever you are, be all there. Are you here? Are you here? In the moment, right now, are you here? Savor your days. Savor your moments. 
savor your joys and the, even the challenges. Maybe perhaps you had a chance to watch The Wonderful Life. It's a wonderful life, George Bailey, right? And you, most of you know the story. You've watched it, but right? George Bailey starts regretting his life and thinking, oh, and I wish it would have been different or things would be different. And so an angel comes and shows him basically what life would have been without him. And there's all these things that happen and change. And so what's the message? The whole message of the movie is this. Ordinary people can have an extraordinary impact doing common things. And I love that because the Bible says the same thing. It says, do what's right in the moment. Do what's right today. It says, persevere in the little things and the hard times. Love God, love others. It's simple. Just do it. It may not seem like a big deal at the time, but like George Bailey stretched over time, it makes a huge impact. A huge impact. Pay attention to what you're doing in your work and in the world. Your daily, everyday common. Isn't this the carpenter? What would they say for you? Isn't this fill in the blank? You know, lately I've looked outside and seen God's masterpiece in creation. Have you noticed how bright the stars are when it's not snow clouds over and stuff? Aren't they beautiful? You have to get up pretty early, though. Well, it doesn't really get light good now until about 8.30. So. But as you look out and you see the masterpiece, but let me show you what God's word says is the masterpiece. God's word says this in Ephesians chapter 2. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done. So none of us can boast about it. Here it is. A simple line. For we are God's masterpiece. Do you look at yourself that way? I'm a masterpiece. No, because somebody will tell you, well, you're not, you're not that great. <laughs> a masterpiece, right? Even our own self-criticism. But God's view of you is this. You're his masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. God set in motion Christ's life and death and resurrection before the world even began so that he could display his masterpiece, you. His grace at work in your life. That's his masterpiece. There's an expression. When you see a turtle on a fence post, you know he didn't get there by himself. <laughs> right? It's obvious somebody had to put that turtle up there. In some ways, as Christ followers, as Christians, you're like a turtle sitting atop a fence post. You're put there by the grace of God. Some people will say, oh, how can I be sure that God is loving and gracious? And this text tells us, look at my people. Look at my church. As imperfect people as they are, look at them. They're my plan A. And I'm using them to make an impact in this world, bringing light where there's darkness. Your display case for the grace of God, as way one author says it. And then Jesus commissions us to partner with him. It's not just enough that he saves us by his grace and establishes the relationship with him, but he sends us out on mission together as his church, as broken as we are, with the failures that we have, with the ideas that we can sometimes run with that aren't necessarily godlike, the sin that so easily can entangle us. God says, this is my church. So in our program, every week we have it there. You probably haven't read a long time, but it says this, welcome to the community. We're imperfect people of all ages and backgrounds and are loved by a perfect God. We're on a journey to know him, growing, laughing, and encouraging each other along the way. In the version of the message, 1 Peter says it this way, 
Your life is a journey you must travel with a deep consciousness of God. Don't miss that line. In fact, if you have your outline out, circle that, write, write that. With a deep consciousness of God. This last week, Jake and I were talking and we were just talking about going about our business and doing our stuff. And, and Jake says, you know, sometimes God will impress me to stop at a certain place. Like maybe somebody in there needs prayer. Or maybe somebody in there needs a little bit of the gospel. Or maybe somebody over here needs just a smiling face. And I thought, isn't that true? That's what it means to walk with a deep consciousness of God. That he's in you. He's with you. He's engaged with you every moment, every day. Don't let the commonness of life and the duty of the day miss that deep consciousness of God. Peter goes on, it costs God plenty to get you out of that dead end, empty headed life you grew up in. He paid with Christ's sacred blood, you know, and he died an unblemished sacrificial lamb. That dead end life. God rescues us. You know, going back to our text, just to kind of bring this to a wrap up, the people, they asked the right questions, didn't they? The people of Nazareth. You still have your Bible open, you see. They say, well, who is this guy? Where does his wisdom come from? Where does his power come from? And in a way, these are questions people are still asking today. And until those, those questions are actually asked, faith, faith can't get produced there. C.S. Lewis and others say it well. It says this, if Jesus is not the son of God, he's a lunatic. If his words are not the truth, he's a liar. If his power is not given by God, he's in league with the devil. Wow. So I, I know it's, it's hard as we're going about our daily business to get to people to these first couple of verses in Ephesians 2, but maybe it starts with our own reflection where it says this, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin. Just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He's the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way. Watch this. Following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. That's the line. Right? That, yeah, I used to live just for myself. I was always focused on me. By our very nature, we're subject to God's anger because of that, just like everyone else. And we can reflect on that deeply for a moment with me. As we think about being God's masterpiece. But then Paul, he says this, but God. Sometimes until you realize where you've been, you don't realize how common can be so extraordinary of where you are. But God, who's so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. I remember when I was about 10 or 11 years old, wrestling with, why did God die for us? Why? And, and I wanted some sort of reasoning. But this tells us because he loved us. He died for us because he loved us. It's who God is. It's his character. It's who almighty God is. He's love. God is love. And he loves us enough to die and rescue and restore us and give us a sense of purpose and hope for 2017. For today. God has a cosmic plan. You're God's masterpiece. You're his picture of grace and his mercy. Mercy means that God does not give me what I do deserve. Grace means that he gives me what I don't deserve. You know, it's interesting what happens here in Jesus' hometown, and maybe you picked up on that in verses 4 through 6 where he basically, the text says, he placed his hands on a few sick people and healed them. 
and he was amazed at their unbelief. You know, and I thought, why didn't Jesus just do some miracles, man? Why didn't he just, just be doing some bold stuff? And then sh that would show them, right? And then they'd believe. You see, Jesus knew their hearts, and Jesus chooses when to exert his power and authority, not at people's demands. You know, show us something, then we'll believe. No, he knew their hearts were already hard. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? Right? Their hearts were, were hard. So Jesus chooses when to use his power. It's not our faith that heals us. It's God's power at work. And it's the absence of faith hinders receptivity to God and his activity. These people missed it, didn't they? Don't miss it. Don't miss the moments, the days, the journey. That God is walking with you for a mighty work in your life. And it may be just being honest in your business. It may be just being truthful with people. It may be just doing the right thing even when it costs you. It may be just the common, ordinary rhythm of life where God is being glorified. Let's pray. Father, the small things in our life we offer up to you as a, an act of worship. If you're sitting here today reflecting on this message and it's a, it's a Sunday of fresh starts with a new year, maybe there is something there for you in your life that you, you don't like or you don't want to stay the same. Maybe you are recognizing there's something you want to see different. Well, say it. Call it out. You're talking to God right now in this moment. Maybe something as simple as, as much as I know how I open my mind and my heart and my life to your power and your grace. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for my sins. Help me to understand as best I can, that I open my life to you and I want to know you. There in your outline, I've included a simple prayer that I'd encourage you to keep posted somewhere or keep it with you. And just pray, Lord, open my eyes. Help me to see you at work today in my life and in the world. And please, Lord, open my ears. Enable me to hear the words you wish to whisper to my heart, thank you for being my Savior, for coming to me. Thank you for being with me and for living in me. Amen.